everybody. I'm Adrian Tucka. I'm a senior developer advocate at MongoDB. And today I want to talk to you about multi-cloud magic, or in other words, how we leverage something called multi-cloud clusters in the real world. So just as a quick overview, so you can decide uh, whether or not you want to stay. I hope you stay. <laughs> but uh, we're going to first talk about what is multi-cloud. We're going to say, uh, get on the same page about what multi-cloud means because it's a word that's been thrown around a lot and a lot of different companies, a lot of different developers and people may have a different uh, understanding of what multi-cloud is. Then we'll go to the next likely question that a lot of people go to, and that's, do we really need a multi-cloud option? And then we'll get into the bulk of the presentation, which is um, explaining some multi-cloud solutions in the real world. We'll see how multi-cloud clusters, and specifically how enabling your data to be on different cloud providers, uh, really benefit you in, in several situations. And then finally, we'll see how easy it is to set up a cluster of your own, a multi-cloud cluster. So what is multi-cloud? If you have any ideas, feel free to put them in the chat, because like I said, there's a lot of different uh, understandings of what they are. But for the context of this presentation, uh, it really is a very simple definition and probably the first one that came into your mind. And that's it's uh, really any single architecture that involves two or more cloud providers. And those cloud providers can be a mix of public or private. Uh, so in the context of this presentation, we're going to focus on the big three, which is GCP, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, and Azure, Microsoft Azure. Um, but for the most part, multi-cloud is two or more clouds. So with that out of the way, we now move on to the next question that usually pops up in most people's minds when they first hear about multi-cloud, and that's, do we really need a multi-cloud option? And if you joined us earlier, I asked, um, and I'm going to ask again, think about the last time you encountered an outage. Think about the last time you couldn't run your pipelines or there was a production outage and people couldn't access your application or even you yourself as a consumer when you could not access something uh, on the internet. Think about those times. And as you think about those times, uh, let's go through actually the last two years about uh, these kinds of outages at a much larger scale. So back in June of 2019, there was a really large outage from Google Cloud. It was so large, they called it the Catch-22 that broke the internet. So what happened here was uh, Google usually runs some maintenance events, some routine configuration changes. And what happened in this particular scenario is that uh, there were a few that uh, were intended for only a specific region, but because of some misconfigurations and a software bug in this uh, automated job, it actually led to the network descheduling a bunch of jobs in a bunch of locations. So if you want to think about the data that was running through Google, all this stuff that flows every single day, and you think about that as having maybe at a normal time in a normal day, six tunnels to be able to pass through and flow through. When this occurred, it effectively got cut down and bottlenecked to two tunnels. So all that traffic is trying to cram itself through only two tunnels when it was used to six. And what happened was it resulted in an internet wide gridlock. And they called it the catch 22 because part of the tools that they needed to access to fix this problem was also knocked out by this outage and this gridlock. So that was a very big um, outage that Google Cloud suffered uh, back in June of 2019. But this was not the only case. I'm sure you can understand that. There was also an AWS outage uh, that at least made the news, and that was in October of 2019. As described by their own retrospective, AWS's retrospective, they said, this event was caused by a failure of our data center control system, which is used to control and optimize the various cooling systems used in our data centers. So what happened in this scenario is they had some 
uh, third-party code in this control system. And that code was used to communicate to the third-party devices that were in these areas, in these data centers. They communicated with fans, with chillers, with temperature sensors, and all of those other things. So due to a bug, again, in the third-party control system, this exchange pretty much resulted in a ton of interactions between the control system and all of those devices. And that led to uh, basically the control system being unresponsive. There were just so many interactions and so many requests, it didn't know what to do. And that resulted in a bunch of racks overheating, and then it started to fail in a lot of the affected availability zones. So that shows that even AWS suffers an outage like this. Uh, and that was in October of 2019. And on and on, right? Google Cloud suffered another major one in March of 2020 when there was a significant router failure in a data center in Atlanta. And then we get to when the coronavirus hit. And that's when a lot of this started really showing the limits of our cloud providers. Azure suffered such uh, data center capacity shortages in Europe that they actually needed to start introducing metering measures, meaning they were only had capacity and only allowing, uh, you know, specific user groups, mission critical user groups and existing customers to be able to interact and use their services. And just as an example of how much unexpected traffic that they now had to face and accommodate uh, right at the height of the pandemic, right? When everybody was, you know, this was the just new, everyone was going on Zoom or in their case, Microsoft Teams, their Teams usage spiked to about 44 million daily users. And that generated over 900 million meeting and calling minutes on Microsoft Teams in a single week. So think about that. Think about all that unexpected scale, that unexpected traffic that you're now just supposed to say, yeah, we can scale and we're able to, you know, accommodate certain bursts or spikes in activities. But as we've seen here with this kind of capacity shortage, this was another level. This was a scale that was not anticipated. And on and on, right? They had another one with a bottleneck uh, in the infrastructure in APAC region. And then the most recent one uh, was the AWS outage in November of 2020. Uh, that was related to the outage with the Kinesis data streams. So that affected a lot of different companies and a lot of different services. So as you think about these larger outages, right, in the last two years, and in between, maybe there will be some that you remember from when you think back to the last time you couldn't access something. And as you see this, it's it's kind of understood, right? We're not expecting these to be up all the time. We have service level agreements. We, we know we uh, adhere to or try to comply and make sure we always have a 99.99 whatever number of nines you need uh, uptime. But uh, we know that these things still occur. But the more important thing to see in this pattern, and especially when you think about your own use cases of outages that you've experienced, whether or not they're related to these larger ones, is that no cloud is spared from these outages. And this is something that's really important to think about because if you're like most companies, you're probably using one of the cloud providers. You may have migrated to one uh, from an on-premises uh, situation to maybe AWS, which most people do. Or maybe you're a European company and you're fully on the Azure ecosystem because it works and that's what uh, you know your architecture requires. But uh, as we start to expand and as we start to become a more global economy and start needing to service more customers, have higher availability, it's becoming more and more prevalent that we need to actually make use of the other cloud providers uh, to help us with these kinds of scenarios. And we'll see why very shortly. So key point here is that no cloud is spared from outages, and that's a problem if you are only on a single one. The next thing that I like to uh, draw attention to is uh, it's not just uh, 
a fad or just in discussions and a buzzword now, um, there was actually a think tank that occurred that took 30 CIOs and IT leaders from various industries and various companies. They took them from Dell, from Allstate, from Visa, from MetLife, all by all whole bunch of companies, and they pretty much sat them down and said, let's talk about multi-cloud. What does this look like? What does this entail? Is it possible? How do we implement this in our very specific structures? Um, and so out of this think tank came some really, really interesting insights. And I've picked out two that I think really hit the nail on the head when it comes to why multi-cloud is not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So the first is Gregory Scherer, who's a VP of Business Platform Technology for Fiserv. And he says, the main driver is what our clients are asking for. We have banks who have an Azure preference. We have banks who have an AWS preference, Google Cloud, and on and on. We don't really get to choose. And so Fiserv, uh, the company that Gregory works for, is an American multinational Fortune 500 company, and they provide financial services. So their clients are people like, uh, or their clients are banks, are thrifts, are credit unions. They are part of a very regulated industry. And in this particular case, they don't have the choice, right? They have to cater to their clients. They have to abide by certain regulations and say that says maybe uh, they are only on Azure because they have gotten their compliance through the, the Azure process, or they have banks who are only working on AWS. And if you're in the business uh, like Fiserv, then you have to accommodate your clients rather than you choosing where to go. And having the ability to give your clients this option and the flexibility to choose which cloud to be able to use is something that's also critical. Another great quote is from Mohan Pucha, who's the vice president of Aon. And he says, we have to be native AWS because of their advanced capabilities in analytics. And we have to be in Azure because frankly, developers love that ecosystem and productive developers are probably the best thing. So in this case, I, I like this quote because this signifies that it's not just from the top down where maybe these higher level decisions are being made and then you just kind of have to follow them and implement them at the individual contributor level, but that more developers are actually starting to see that this is a, a another tool in their toolbox. It's another thing that would be nice to implement and get right. And as we'll see later, most developers I think will agree that it, in the end, it really comes down to we want to use the best tool for the job. We want to solve the problem and we don't want to be locked into any specific tool or cloud vendor, but rather use the one that makes the most sense. And so now with that kind of laid out, we know that outages occur. We know that no cloud is spared. And we also know that there is a want and a need for a multi-cloud architecture. So now we'll see how that is actually being implemented in a few real world scenarios. And in this particular case, all of my scenarios will show the use of a multi-cloud cluster. So that is something that MongoDB Atlas provides. And what that just means is that you're able to move your data and host your data on any one of the three cloud providers and a single architecture architecture can span those three cloud providers and we'll see how we do that now so the first scenario that's kind of the most common the one that's easiest to choose and uh, when people think about um, migrating to a multi-cloud solution this is the one that makes the most sense for them and this is a data sovereignty or data residency type of um, compliance issues. So in Canada, the government of Canada sets out a strategic IT plan every few years or so. And this plan pretty much just outlines, these are the best practices, here are the directives that we want all of our government entities to follow as it applies to different IT strategies. 
And in this case, they have one called the Direction for Electronic Data Residency. And what this states is that any sensitive electronic data that was under government control, so any public entity data, has to be stored within the geographic boundaries of Canada. And although there are a few exceptions of like pre-approved Government of Canada, uh, diplomatic or consular missions, for the most part, it has to stay within Canada. So a few provinces, um, they have implemented this in slightly different ways. So British Columbia and Nova Scotia, they take all data, right? They adhere to that to a T and it says all public data uh, needs to be stored in Canada. Whereas Ontario, they are applying this solely to healthcare data, so health records. And this brings us to the first scenario and the first client I want to talk about, which is an emergency services company who, uh, you know, abided by this healthcare, they were in Ontario, and they needed to host their data uh, on AWS Montreal. Now, they were on AWS Montreal, like most of these Canadian businesses, because, well, AWS Montreal is actually the only region that AWS offers in that area. So it's not too far-fetched to think that most of them were on AWS. Uh, and AWS currently has about 35% of the market share in cloud. So most people are on AWS. Now, with a company like this client, uh, who's an emergency services company, they could not afford to have outages. It's almost unacceptable to have outages. And most of us know that any kind of application downtime is really bad, right? You either, that translates to either financial loss or to some sort of reputation loss. And in particular for a company that does, that has an application like an emergency services application, it's unacceptable, right? So this is what happened with them. They were on AWS Montreal. And of course, if this ever went out, even though it's rare, but not as rare as we have seen, uh, they are kind of out of luck. They did not architect uh, their application to fail over gracefully, nor did they have the means to because they were all of their data was stored in AWS Montreal. So effectively, if this region went out, then their application also goes out. So how they fixed the situation was they had to take advantage of some other regions. And in this case, the first one they added was a GCP Montreal region. So the Google Cloud region offered one in Montreal. And that was the, the easiest step and the first step that they took to at least be able to fail over in case they fail, uh, in case an AWS outage occurred. And at that time, they were very, um, they were not confident because of the last AWS outage with the uh, data streams. They just said this can't occur and that really pushed them to move towards this solution. But because of the nature of this application, they needed to add some additional fault tolerance. And so they also made use of some other Canadian regions. In this case, the next closest ones for them were the Azure Canada Central region, which is in Toronto, and the Azure Canada East region, which is in Quebec. So now, in this scenario, this works out much better for their requirements because now if AWS were to go out, well, GCP can step in, they fail over immediately and that is no problem. And then in the even more rare event, but still plausible event that the entire region goes out in Montreal, that's when their Azure regions can step up and fill in the gap. And so in this particular case, having a multi-cloud cluster that spanned across AWS, GCP, and Azure was very beneficial for them. It, it allowed them to have greater availability to the point that it almost seemed redundant. But again, in this case, the type of application that they had warranted it. So that was Canada, and that was kind of the data residency issue. Another common one is from Australia. Uh, and we'll see that in a moment. So Australia passed some legislation uh, that was called the My Health Records Act of 2012. And it basically stated the same thing. There's a requirement 
to hold to not hold or take records out of Australia. So if you're any kind of processing business, anyone that held records for uh, um, individuals that related to any uh, medical records, those needed to stay within the borders of Australia. So let's take a look at the cloud landscape of Australia. If you look at this and you're a company that's like this, first, uh, your options are pretty much uh, situated and centralized in Sydney. And again, this suffers from the same problem that this uh, the Canadian company faced, which is, sure, um, you know, let's say they were also on AWS because a lot of people are on AWS, majorities on AWS. Well, if that ever went out or if they ever had a full regional outage, well, they're out of luck because all of them are in Sydney. So in this case, again, Azure is was able to provide higher availability because Azure was the only other cloud provider that provided a region outside of Sydney. In this case, they had an Australia Southeast region, which is located in Melbourne. And to go even further, uh, they noticed, Azure noticed, that there was also additional compliance requirements for Australia that required the use of an additional region for in-country disaster recovery. So they added a couple more in Canberra, which is the Australia Central and Australia Central 2 regions. So again, in this case, this is just showing the point that sometimes there are a lot of other places like this where there are only one or a very few number of regions to choose from. And the only way to abide by either some compliance requirements or some failover requirements is to make use of other cloud providers. And that's exactly what happened here. And in case you're wondering, Azure also has one in Sydney. So those are the, the getting your feet wet, the low hanging fruit type of scenarios. And now I wanna talk about some other more specific scenarios that we've seen uh, multi-cloud use. So for this case, we had a client who had um, an application that was running on AWS. They basically had a help desk uh, application and what they wanted to do was they wanted to extend this as they started to uh, iterate on this application, they wanted to add uh, a recommendation feature. And after talking to their developers and researching it out, they found that what they wanted to use was AutoML, which is a tool from Google that uses machine learning to reveal the structure and meaning of text. So what they wanted to do with this application is basically feed it to this analytics application that would use AutoML, uh, feed it with data from their production workloads and their help desk software so that they could in turn recommend some knowledge base articles that may be relevant and help their uh, analysts or their technicians serve their customers faster, help them out. So in this particular case, we see that there is a very glaring uh, solution or problem to solve, right? And that's how do we get the data over there? How do we get that data? How do we get portions of their production data that they want to use uh, and feed it into this new analytics feature that they want to uh, add? I'll give you a moment because you might be thinking of some reasons or some solutions. Maybe you've done this before. And maybe the first one you thought of is this option. So this is one way we've been solving it time and time again. This is the uh, way we've been kind of solving this problem already, and that's to write some custom scripts. But uh, if you've ever done this before, you know that, yes, custom scripts will work. Custom scripts will work for mostly anything. But the problem is it's, it's custom. Anytime you build something that's so purpose-built and so unique for a very specific problem that usually leads to longer maintenance times. It's some other external piece that you need to maintain. And in this particular case, that's something that this client really did not want. They wanted it to be as seamless as possible and they wanted to have less moving parts. They even tried, you know, in the initially when they were iterating on this, um, you know, developers like to automate the pain away. So even if they, tr even though when they tried to use something like Kafka, which is streaming updates from one source to another, that was still another piece. Uh, and they really did not want that as part of this solution. So we passed on this option. <laughs> 
The next option to be able to accommodate this is something called backup and restore. So in this scenario, we would take snapshots from their live data from AWS and restore it to uh, the destination one that was going to be used with the analytics feature. But again, this is still a, a very costly process to maintain. It's another piece. And uh, the bigger problem with this option is that the client did not like that the data that they were receiving on the analytics end was received in batches. So effectively, they were always waiting for new data to be uploaded and restored. So in this particular case, and to preface it by saying that this client was obviously already using MongoDB Atlas, what did help them was something like a multi-cloud cluster. So number one, they were already using uh, MongoDB clusters to host their data and, you, and they're using our managed database service. Well, how they ended up achieving the solution is they end up taking advantage of one of the specific types of nodes that you can add to your cluster, which is called a read-only analytics node and they spun this up hosted on GCP. So now the data is where it needs to be. And because it was um, uh, deployed as an analytics node, what this means is that these workloads, any analytical workloads, anything that dealt with um, complex or long, long running queries, anything that had to do with their analytics feature can be isolated to this particular node. Meanwhile, all of the electable nodes or the production nodes that were still on AWS, they were, you know, left alone. They were not competing for resources in this case. There was no requirement for them to um, to split the difference and make sure their analytical queries were also being serviced and then affecting their production workloads. So in this particular case, this very much helped them and solve their problem because they could isolate the workloads. Now, another scenario for multi-cloud is something called cloud arbitrage. And, and I will, again, caveat this by saying that the client who is working with this and trying to get it to a more consistent state, uh, there's still a lot of issues with it. It's very experimental, but if we are able to solve those problems, could be the, uh, as they like to say, the holy grail of being able to use multi-cloud. So in this scenario, what they wanted to do was basically they had some workloads that they wanted to have take advantage of the best pricing across the three clouds. So let's say Azure had the best pricing for this. They want to burst those workloads over to Azure. And likewise, as they continue to monitor all of the different cloud providers and their pricing, if for whatever reason AWS met their cost threshold, they would want to burst it over there too and so on and so forth. Uh, if uh, GCP went down lower, they would burst some there too. The issue with this is that uh, there were there's still very many um, differences across the cloud providers. So even with a more generalized workload and set of tasks that this client is trying to you know, burst across, there's still some manual intervention required and there's still some tweaking that needs to be done. So it's not like you can just uh, happily burst them over and they're gonna do their thing and run on the cheapest cloud at the time. They still need to intervene with some configuration changes and make them work, uh, tweak them to fit the cloud provider that they have bursted on. So as that continues to evolve and continues to become uh, hopefully more agnostic, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it because all three cloud providers are going to be slightly different, I think, for the most part. Uh, but if that ever did become the case, that would be something that this client uh, effectively would use a multi-cloud cluster for because the biggest bottleneck for them in doing this was having the data available already on all of the three cloud providers. And now the last uh, example of this kind of cost optimization scenario and theme. Uh, this one is a very extreme scenario, but it is something that has actually happened. So in this case, we had a major auto manufacturing company and uh, they were running some production workloads on AWS. And this company, uh, as I'm sure most other major companies, uh, whenever they 
uh, discuss which cloud provider they're going to use. They usually have conversations and price negotiations. And that's exactly what this particular um, company did. They actually spoke to AWS and Azure uh, at the same time and found that they were able to get better pricing with Azure as a result of these conversations. So what they wanted was to be able to say, the moment that they got out of that meeting and said, yep, we have better pricing in Azure, move it all over, they wanted to do that. However, again, the bottleneck was the data. They had architected their applications to be able to move over in that way, but the data was the harder part. And if you've ever had to deal with migrations and making sure those are all applied in the correct order and getting data over, it's, it's not an easy task. So in this particular case, a multi-cloud cluster, again, was the right solution for this scenario because rather than going through all of that um, headache and going through scripts and all of that, uh, and again, because they were already using MongoDB Atlas for uh, portions of their databases and data, they could easily just change their providers. So we could gracefully roll over to Azure or whichever um, cloud provider they happen to get the best pricing from at that point in time. And this little animation that I did here of, you know, change provider and it moving over fully to Azure, it's not as contrived as it might look like on the screen because that's literally what you do in the Atlas UI. You, you go into the configuration settings and you set Azure to be the highest priority cloud provider. And that will then uh, invoke the graceful rollover process immediately. And we'll see that um, in the moment at the demo. So we talked about some very specific uh, client scenarios. And now I want to talk about why it's not just them, but also more and more developers are becoming more amenable to the idea of multi-cloud. So as I've alluded to earlier, we want to use the best tools for the job. If you think about these discussions that we've had about, you know, what tools are you using or which cloud provider did you choose and why, or even what certifications are you uh, studying for, which ones matter more, you'll always know that there are going to be preferences, either your own individual preferences or preferences that have been set by the company that you work for. But uh, as developers, I think a really core thing that we all feel and know is that we want to use the best tools for the job. So let's say you have been working with AWS, you're probably going to be the champion of AWS Lambda or S3 because you've used it, you know it, you know that it works. But sometimes uh, there are teams who find that there is a preference to use some other tools that are not on the current cloud provider that they're on. For example, the recommendation feature that I spoke about earlier, their devs came to the conclusion that anything with machine learning or artificial intelligence, they actually wanted to use Google Cloud services because they looked to be the best tools for the job. And likewise, a lot of companies are on Azure and use all of the Azure services. It's a great ecosystem. But again, sometimes they might want to use portions or services that belong in AWS. And so having a multi-cloud solution and specifically moving the data over makes it much easier for us to be able to use the tools that we want to and use the right tools for the job. As another example, we're now even more responsible for higher availability and lower latency. So with all of these outages occurring and all of these um, uh, production issues that we see, that's kind of like high on our list of making sure that doesn't happen, especially as we start growing into a global market. We have other areas to service. And in the situations we saw with Canada and Australia, maybe there are compliance uh, requirements that we have to abide by, or maybe you're a part of countries where there's only one region and one cloud provider that's available. It makes sense that using a multi-cloud solution in the form of a multi-cloud cluster and making use of the other regions that are available, that helps us achieve that higher availability. That helps us achieve lower latency. You could spin up a few nodes in other service areas that are apart from your main one, and you can optimize local reads. So instead of having to trans uh, or traverse 
you know, really, really long and really laggy wait times, you can spin up a node right where your services are and give them that same experience that you want all of your customers to have. And finally, as we start to evolve and continue to implement this kind of solution in many different ways, I think what's going to happen for us as devs is that we are going to look for more solutions to be more cloud agnostic because as this becomes more prevalent and it becomes a question of oh yeah we're using this on aws but or oh this client needs to be on azure well then our new set of issues and problems that we need to solve is being cloud agnostic so that we can be where the customers are or be where they need us to be and Finally, the last scenario I'll kind of share with you is the future proofing scenario and in particular mergers and acquisitions. So another very common case that we've seen is that we have a European company who is fully on Azure and they acquire a company that is fully on AWS. So what needs to occur here? A cross cloud migration needs to happen here. And how do we do that? Well, there's always custom scripting, but we've already talked about those flaws. So that was certainly not the case here, although that it's been done and it's been painfully done. The next option is something called live migration. So again, uh, these companies were using MongoDB Atlas already. And in that case, that gave them the option to use this, which is part of MongoDB Atlas. But the problem with live migration is that there's still a, a bunch of manual intervention that needs to occur. You, see, you still need to set up a destination Atlas cluster. Uh, so in this case, we'd need to set one up on Azure to be able to migrate to. And then the more annoying part about this is that the connection string needs to be bounced, meaning once you are fully migrated over from AWS to Azure, uh, you need to make sure traffic is properly going now to Azure and not to AWS. And in this particular case, you still need to, again, manually configure and make sure that the connection strings have been updated properly. So in this case, Azure, or I'm sorry, uh, this case, a multi-cloud cluster was, again, the correct solution and the most beneficial solution in this scenario. Why? Well, as a, a minimum, there's always a set of three nodes in a MongoDB Atlas cluster. So how this occurred and how this um, gracefully rolled over is that they would first start migrating over two of the secondaries um, of that cluster. And then once those have been migrated, they elect a new primary. So if you've seen the first one was actually hosted on AWS, but as we migrate and as we are sure that the first two secondaries have been moved over, we now elect the new primary to be on the new cloud, the destination cloud that we want to be in. And finally, we migrate the remaining secondary. And that's how it is moved uh, and migrated over to Azure. But as you might be uh, guessing already, the most important part about why this works and why this is a much preferred solution is that you don't have to change the connection string. The connection string uh, does not need any manual intervention and it's going to be properly cut over. So that means all traffic now after this migration is going to go where you expect it to go. And in this case, it's going to be the cluster on Azure. And so that's the, the smattering of uh, scenarios that we see in the real world today of how multi-cloud clusters are being used uh, to implement a multi-cloud solution. And I'll end with this, uh, which is a very key component. And that's uh, Brad Lewis, who's the VP and global lead at Dell. Uh, he says, if you want to start to have true portability of applications, Obviously, the data has to go with the application. So in all of these scenarios, uh, architecting the application is obviously something that needs to be set first, right? But what we found is that the biggest bottleneck to implementing a multi-cloud solution is getting that data to go with it as easily as they have made our uh, applications um, be able to take advantage of filling over to multiple clouds. And so with that, I will show you how easy it is to set up um, a multi-cloud cluster. <laughs> 
So if you've ever been on MongoDB Atlas before, uh, this is the UI and it's fairly similar to any other place that you've set up a service. So you will set up the cloud provider, the initial provider that you would be hosting your cluster on. Uh, but for a multi-cloud cluster, as you can see here, you just uh, switch on this toggle. And what this toggle now shows is that you're now able to choose from those different purpose-made nodes uh, that to make up your cluster. And so in this case, I'm going to set up a, a 221 node distribution that just uh, is the simplest configuration we can create to ensure that we have read and write availabilities. So I'm going to have GCP as my highest priority region as I'm based in Las Vegas. And we're going to add another region here. The next closest ones that I know of are going to be Azure's in California and AWS also uh, in Northern California. And you'll see here, we will get a warning because we always, as a best practice, want to make sure we have an odd number of electable nodes. This ensures reliable elections, meaning Anytime we have to elect a new primary node, uh, we want to make sure we have an odd number because if we have an even number, they could vote and the split could the vote could be split down the middle. So we want an odd one to always have a tiebreaker. So we'll change this to one. And uh, that's it. And here you'll see the two other nodes. So this one is the read only nodes, which like I mentioned, uh, would be great to use if you need to optimize some local reads in different service areas. And then this is the analytics node that you saw in our recommendation feature example, where these ones are purpose built uh, for any uh, workload isolations that deal with analytics. And so we would create the cluster and I'm not gonna make you sit and wait to see <laughs> that being deployed. So I have one already here and this is what you would see. As requested, we would have the preferred region as GCP as I've had. You'll see that it's set as the primary. And then you'll also see that we have our two other regions uh, of California and AWS or Azure and AWS as secondary. And as a last portion, um, when I would mention, you know, it really is that simple to change certain configuration settings. Well, in the scenarios I showed you, let's say we needed to make um, Azure be the highest priority, we needed to migrate over. What we would do is literally that. We would set this to be the highest priority uh, cloud provider and things would start migrating over and those would be our highest priority and uh, a cloud provider that would be in use for our cluster. And that's pretty much it. So I want to say thank you.